them. Okay, hello everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, today's lecture is going to be presented in English, uh, as this is uh, an invited talk. So it's also a uh, live stream uh, via Zoom for all of the um, uh, attendee online. And uh, I would like to present our speaker. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to, um, to introduce uh, our speaker today, Ray Morel, uh, who is going to talk about automatic parallelization for concurrent programming from the past through the present, and also talking about the very near future. Uh, this is a subject in which uh, we should all be deeply interested uh, because uh, introducing this kind of parallelism to uh, application is obviously uh, a complex and tedious task as everybody already learned in this, uh, in this course. And as a result, the field of automatic parallelization uh, emerged specifically with OpenMP. Our speaker, although having spent almost his entire career uh, advising people on how to parallel uh, scientific codes, also focused on how and if uh, it is possible to do so without his help, uh, meaning in an automatic manner. Rem is a computer science PhD student at Ben Gurion University and a One API student ambassador. The main focus of his PhD, a PhD research, which disclaimer he's uh, under my supervision, is using state of the art uh, NLP, a natural language processing models, to automatically introduce parallelization schemes, such as OpenMP directives and MPI in general to legacy and new codes. In addition, he is a researcher over the last five years uh, in the scientific computing lab at NRCN, uh, focusing on parallel programming and scientific computing uh, and also supercomputing. So please join me in uh, welcoming Ram. Ram, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Garth, for the introduction. And so, um, Actually, my first uh, degree was uh, in uh, physics and computer science. My master's degree was in uh, physics, and now my PhD is in computer science. Some people say that I didn't decide what I like better, physics or computer science, but I think I know the answer. So uh, as Gal said, I'm going to explain and present uh, automatic parallelization, the past, what was in the past, what is now in the present, and what will be in the future, which is my main research at my PhD. So why the need for automatic parallelization? Well, as you uh, should know, that shared memory architectures is everywhere. You can see it in your iPhones, you can see it in your laptops, your smartwatches, obviously in everyday computers. But not everyone knows how to parallelize and utilize these architectures. And even those who know how to do it, don't um, usually uh, will try and uh, uh, end up in parallelizing some code that they didn't see before. And it could contain uh, uh, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands lines of code and uh, with a lot of uh, uh, for loops and they just don't know um, all the dependencies and it's really hard uh, for them to do. So people saw to the, uh, to the solution for, um, in an automatic parallelization uh, approach to um, apply these parallelization paradigms and speed up the applications. So a disclaimer for this presentation, I'm gonna talk only about optimizations and parallelization on for loops and not um, SPMD, if you guys know, uh, with MPI and uh, things like that. So what am I gonna talk about today? I'm gonna to talk the foundations of shared memory parallelization, which is how can we achieve this automatic process? How can we eliminate the things that interfere with achieving this? And then I'm going to talk about source-to-source -source automatic parallelization compilers, which is compilers that try to insert these directives automatically. I'm going to present three of those compilers. I'm going to talk how good they are and what are their limitations. And then I'm going to talk about the work that we've done uh, three years ago, which is Compa, which tried to uh, um, overcome their limitations by um, combining them. And then I'm going to talk about my current uh, uh, work, which is Pragformer, which is uh, trying to parallelize code with NLP techniques. 
Okay, so let's start. Uh, the foundations of shared memory par parallelism. What actually interferes with paralyz paralyzing codes? So how can we or a compiler decide if we can paralyze this loop? Let's look at this example. Can we paralyze it or can't we? I want it to be interactive. So um, when I ask questions, uh, you can think about it and give me an answer. Okay, so it's a good point. A and B may be uh, alias to one another. And another thing is, is K. K actually has a plus plus sign, which means that it has a read and write operation, and this is not safe to paralyze. What about this code? Hmm? You can theoretically, but if B is actually alias to A, then you can't because they depend on one another. So it's also a question. Maybe it is alias, maybe it isn't. And um, so both of them is kind of a questionable, but the left one is for sure no. So if you try to summarize how can we understand if we can or can't paralyze it, you end up with three main rules that um, if and only if they aren't uh, inside a loop, then you can paralyze it. These three rules are uh, true dependency, anti-dependency, and output dependency. Meaning if you have a for loop and, you, um, and it doesn't contain any of these dependency, then you can paralyze the loop. So what is true dependency? True dependency is when you have an instruction in a for loop that um, is from the format of read and then you write. Okay, so if we look at the uh, right example, then you can see A in position I plus one equals to A in position uh, I, and you have actually uh, read after write because you write A in position I plus one, and in the next iter iteration, you read it. This is what, what is called true dependency. So can we parallelize this loop? Well, we can. Can we somehow modify this code to be able to uh, um, parallelize it? Well, we can think about may maybe uh, uh, giving it another uh, array, but actually it won't work. When you have true dependency, there are it's almost impossible to parallelize the loop because it's it's a true dependency. You, you can't play games like um, giving another pointer, maybe uh, assigning this array to another one. It, it, it's impossible. So most of the cases with the true dependency, you can't parallelize. Anti-dependency is the same thing, but you have a read um, before the write, like write after read. And how does it look like? It looks like the example from the right, you have A in position I equals A in position I plus one. And what happens? You write to A in position I, and then in the previous iteration, you read that value. So can we parallelize this loop? We can in this, in this form, but can we change this code to be able to parallelize it? Yes, we can. How? Yeah, we can we can uh, execute each uh, two iterations not together, and then uh, we can parallelize. The... If it's not together, then you lose the no. meaning of so. So you can eventually uh, execute two iterations and just like iterate two steps each time. And then you can uh, uh, um, you have the problem with the boundaries between the two iterations. The um, another solution is by creating another array, for example, some temp and assigning AI to that temp. And then uh, you can replace the A uh, in position I plus one with that temp. And then it, and then it works because you don't access and uh, run over the, uh, the, the values. Output dependency is when you have an instruction that occurs with write after a write operation. Uh, so if we look at the right example, um, we, which is, I know, uh, kind of dumb, but uh, um, you have here a write operation in A in position I, and the next iteration, you also write to that value. So you have a write after write, and you, of course, can parallelize this. Can we somehow change or modify the code so we can? Well, of course, because we can just uh, uh, um, merge the two uh, instructions together. Um, usually when you have an output dependency, it's because uh, lazy programming, because um, people don't think about maybe we can merge these calculations and get rid of this uh, uh, dependency. 
So uh, people understood that if we have these three uh, dependencies, we can't paralyze the suit. And then they started thinking, maybe I can uh, set uh, a bunch of rules that can help me eliminate these dependencies in some cases. So we're gonna go through some of these uh, uh, cases. The first one is loop peeling and splitting is when uh, I have some dependency on a specific iteration. And then I just take this specific iteration and I uh, put, pull it out from the, uh, the for loop. For example, I have this uh, code, which I assign uh, to a, um, uh, the variable last um, a in position i. Well, if we look at the logic of the code, we'll know that the last value of last will be a in position n minus one. So we can just peel that operation and leave it outside the loop, and then we eliminate it, the dependency. The second one is induction variable substitution. We we sometimes see code where we all don't have we don't only have the uh, index i, we also have another index. Maybe we'll do k plus plus, maybe plus equals two, and um, this is actually uh, a dependency that we saw before. And um, the induction variable substitution says that let's take this k, which causes um, the dependency, and let's try and, uh, and replace it with uh, something numerical, for example, this star. The third way is forward substitution. In this case, I have uh, a variable that has uh, this uh, term, and I use it uh, multiple times to calculate some value. And I have here an output uh, dependency because um, I think it's clear why uh, we can parallelize the loop on, on the left. And um, what the forward substitution says is let's take the expression of temp and um, explicit, explicitly express them in um, where I use it. And then uh, I don't have uh, uh, the dependencies on, on temp and we can parallelize the loop. Another way to do the, um, to, uh, um, to eliminate the same dependency is with sc scalar expansion is instead of um, placing the explicit expression of temp, I will create uh, an array of temp, yeah? And then I'll replace uh, um, the, the positions. This has a, a, a bit of a setback because you uh, use more memory because I uh, allocate another array. So it has its drawbacks. Why don't you use a Okay, so now I'm leaving OpenMP out of the scope. Of course, you can use a private, but now I'm just talking in general. Let's think about. Then, yeah, okay, you, you can actually do that. Yeah, correct. You can. And uh, you have a lot of other techniques, no splitting. Uh, reduction recognition, loop skewing, and uh, all of these transformation actually allows us to eliminate these dependencies and allow us to parallelize the loop. So the main idea of automatic parallelization is identifying these uh, dependencies, these data dependencies in the loops, try and eliminate them, and if we succeeded in eliminating them, we can parallelize the loop, and we're done. So let's talk about now automatic parallelization uh, in practice. Um, how do they work? Um, um, two, may, two different approaches to automatic parallelization. So what is automatic parallelization? Is transforming the serial code to a parallel one automatically. Okay, this is achieved, as I said, by identifying the data dependencies, trying to eliminate them. And if we manage to eliminate them, then we can parallelize it. Over the years, there were two main approaches to attack this problem. The first one is in a uh, compilation stage, which is where the compiler tries to identify these dependencies. And when he translates to machine code, he already will insert these uh, parallel uh, uh, directives or instructions. For example, uh, I think you saw it in uh, one of the uh, lectures, uh, the SIMD uh, instruction, which is a compiler instruction. And the other way is with source to source. This means that I'm taking a source code and when I apply this source to source uh, parallelizer, it will give me back a source code with the directives, for example, the OpenMP directive. If you look at the history of uh, automatic parallelization, the first uh, uh, time you will encounter it was in uh, 18, 1866, um, uh, 86, sorry. And uh, the idea was let's represent the source code as a graph. 
we'll try to uh, um, detect the dependencies. And if we detect them, we'll put some uh, automatic uh, uh, instruction. It was called paraphrase. And um, over the year, this was the base of, uh, of compilers and uh, parallelizing. And uh, how does the automatic parallelization process work? Let's dive a bit into details. The first phase is parsing the code. You take the source code, you try and represent it in a graph way. W why exactly the graph way? Because it, with the graph, you can understand the, the dependencies a lot better. You know the, uh, the control flow of the, of the code, and uh, it's a lot more easier to uh, understand the dependencies with these graphs. The second phase is applying some data dependency algorithm to identify these true anti-output uh, dependencies, and they will try to eliminate them. And the third phase is just paralyzing the loop. If it doesn't have any dependencies, or it has some dependencies and we can, uh, for example, put a private clause on it, then we'll insert the OpenMP directive or some other thing. From here on, I'm going to only focus about the approach of source to source and with OpenMP. It's the most common ones. So automatic parallelization with OpenMP. So as I said, we start with the source code. After phase one, we'll create this uh, abstract syntax tree of the code. Then we'll go to phase two, which is applying some data dependence uh, algorithm on the representation. And then we'll produce the open, uh, open MP code with uh, the original code. So regarding phase one, um, why also we need uh, the abstract syntax tree? Well, we sometimes have cases where we uh, call some function and this function may have function side effects, meaning um, a font one could be writing to A in position I, could be reading from it, and then we can't really parallelize it. So we need to know what uh, hides behind the function one. That's why we need the abstract syntax tree. Another thing, as you said, is pointer aliasing. This looks like we can't parallelize this loop, but we actually can, because we need to know if B is actually pointing to A. Because if it does, then we have here a dependency and we can't parallelize it. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the data dependencies algorithms. Um, um, it's basically uh, an NP hard problem with identifying the data dependencies, um, which means it's really hard to um, know for sure if, uh, if it does have dependencies. So there are two main algorithms that try to approximate this problem, which is called uh, greatest common the divisor and Banjari, um, which they, um, if they manage to converge, then they'll tell you with 100% if it does uh, have a dependency or it doesn't. But if it doesn't converge, then you don't know what happened. And, uh, and if, of course, uh, the conversion depends on the amount of um, uh, lines in your for loop. Um, something, yeah, if it converges, then you know for sure if you can parallelize it, because the answer from the conversion can say you can parallelize it. Okay, so, but if it doesn't converge, which can uh, happen, um, it, it, only, it not only depends on the amount of lines of code, it also depends on, uh, on uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, arrays that you have, the, um, um, the, the, the amount of iterations that you do. So it depends on a lot of things, but it can not converge. So let's try and understand what are the limitations to uh, the automatic parallelization with OpenMP? What can and can't we automate? So can we somehow automate the process of inserting a Pragma OMP parallel for? Well, yes, exactly. It's with these data dependence algorithms. So this we can uh, automate. What about OpenMP task? Can we somehow automate the process of inserting Pragma OMP task? Well, actually it's hard and very risky um, because you need to identify two um, independent functions or tasks um, in the code. And not only that, you need to understand that they are truly independent in one another. And you need to know that the amount of uh, okay, computation that is done is worth opening threads on it. So it, it can be maybe theoretically possible, but I didn't find anyone that implements it um, because I think it's uh, most of the cases uh, um, counter effective. 
What about no weight? Can we identify no weight? Theoretically, we can. But in practice, because these data um, dependencies algorithm are really uh, intensive, they, they are derived from NP-hard problems, so they take a lot of time to converge. To identify the no weight, you need to first uh, identify that this for loop um, can be parallelized and the other loop. And then you need to uh, verify that, the, um, that these two loops are independent in, on, in one another. So it becomes a really, really, really hard problem and it will probably never converge. So no one actually implements the no weight statement. What about single, master, critical, atomic? You, you actually can, and one of the compilers does uh, that, but uh, um, no, I only found one that does because I think it's uh, really hard to identify these cases because you really need uh, a lot of knowledge of the algorithm because, um, and not only you need uh, an inherent knowledge of the algorithm, you know, because critical is always uh, creating some kind of uh, a bottleneck to the code because only one uh, thread can enter this place. So most of the times they won't implement it because they say if it has a critical inside it, it's probably not worth parallelizing it. So in the end, you have these automatic parallelization uh, compilers that only uh, introduce pragma one p parallel four and their uh, data clauses. So let's see an example. I have this uh, piece of code, okay, and then I'll uh, use some source-to-source uh, -source automatic parallelization, and it will process, it will think, and then in the end, it produces me this loop. Okay, we'll see it again. I have this code, this for loop, which can be parallelized, and then I'll go to my terminal. I'll execute one of these source-to-source uh, -source compilers. It will process, it will find the dependencies, and after that, it will produce me this OMP pragma. Because we have a lot of data dependencies, algorithms, and uh, other heuristics for uh, identifying when we want to put a private, last private, first private, we end up with a lot of tools that have different capabilities that can identify different uh, um, directives. And um, it, it's not a, a, a something that you can create one tool and it will work for everything. You have multiple loops, uh, multiple tools, and each one can be uh, suited for a different case. So um, uh, my, my first work with, uh, yes. So uh, we, we can, um, identifying pointer aliasing is pretty hard if you have a huge code because you need to find the occurrence of, uh, of the pointer inside the loop. And then you have to search the whole code where it was, a, where it points to another array. You have one tool that does that. And, but it's experimental. They, um, like after five years that they have it, it's still an experimental because it's not complete. So I guess there is some uh, um, kind of hard algorithmic to find, um, but all of these uh, tools come with an option that uh, you can, as a developer say, my code doesn't contain aliasing. And then he assumes that there is no aliasing. Otherwise he'll assume that everything is aliased. So we'll go through three of these tools, which is Autopal, Setus, and Parfol. Autopal um, supports can uh, insert uh, OpenMP directives on C and C++. It was last updated in 2017. The Parfol um, is suited for C, Fortran, CUDA, OpenCL. Mm -hmm. It was last updated in 2015. <laughs> And the Cetus, which is suited for C, was updated a couple of months ago. Um, a bit about Autopar, um, it supports object-oriented programming. Um, it can verify if your directive is correct, um, but it was uh, removed uh, for some reason two months ago. Parfol uh, specializes in interprocedural analysis, which is determining the function side effects. Um, but, but he sometimes changes the code um, really heavily it like replaces uh, um, statements with constant variables. Uh, so it's sometimes uh, uh, unwanted. And uh, Cetus um, implements several data dependence algorithms. It implements also the GCD, also the boundary and another one. It's the most up to date. And it assures that the loop has more than 10,000 operations. Why is this so critical? 
because uh, the parallelize uh, the source-to-source uh, -source compiler doesn't know if the loop has uh, how much iteration it has because it's sometimes things that you derive in runtime. So you might end up with parallelizing loops that uh, have a low amount of uh, computation and then it's counter effective because the overhead of creating the threads outweighs the uh, speed up that you gain from parallelizing the loop. I think that today we, uh, Exactly. So this is this is um, this is not only true for today, but in three or four years ago, if you used uh, on uh, the Intel zone, then you would find out that ten thousand is still not enough. So uh, um, it was maybe true at the time that they created the tool, which was uh, seven years ago, eight years ago. But nowadays, it's. Uh, I think it should be maybe 10,000, uh, 100,000. Yeah. So how good are these compilers? So how do we actually compare and know how good they are? First thing, we want to know if they can catch cases of array privatization, meaning not just a private on a uh, temp variable, we want it to be a private on uh, an array variable. Can it be applied to nested loop? If I have nested loop, can it identify correctly? What about assumed pointer aliasing? How does it treat it? And how does it treat an optimized code? And what about determining function side effects? So as a case study, we'll see the uh, matrix uh, multiplication uh, algorithm, which I think you saw in one of your homeworks, um, which is simple. It's three for loops and uh, the uh, uh, multiplication. So after applying Autopal on this code, we ended up with this directive. Are we satisfied? Why not? Exactly, we have a parallel four inside a parallel four. And in, in some cases, it will create an overhead of threads. It will try to create another team of threads and then will be counter effective. Now also that, they also de decided to define uh, first private on N, although I don't touch N at all. So it's a weird uh, thing to say. It's not wrong. It's just uh, something that I wouldn't think about, or I don't think anyone would think about putting a first private on that N. What about file forward? Can you produce this directive? Are we satisfied? Okay, so actually, um, if you think about it, you never, uh, a thread never uh, um, touches the same um, index as another thread. So it's actually the optimal directive. If I would uh, put a directive on the innermost loop, then yes, you're right, I need a reduction. But this is actually the, the most effective and uh, best uh, directive. Because CIJ never gets um, overwritten by another thread. So this is the result of uh, Setus. Are we satisfied with this result? So th this if here is the, if uh, the, it ensures that it has more than 10,000 operations. Well, yeah, you're right. We, we are satisfied because it also inserted here uh, a directive and another directive here. So it, we actually uh, assume that it will um, be the worst than all the three. So what about function side effects? Um, so we'll take the computation. Yeah. Hmm? Someone asking a question? Okay. So um, we'll take the calculation uh, of the multiplication and we'll move it up to a function. And um, Autopad and Setus didn't uh, determine the function side effect and they didn't insert a directive at all. Um, although Setus um, in his newer version um, did manage to insert a, a, the same directive because um, they fixed it in uh, the, the next version that it can determine the function side effects. And Pagfall managed to do it um, perfectly because um, this is his uh, um, uh, um, main uh, uh, um, advantage. What about pointer aliasing? So to make this code with pointer aliasing, we're just gonna change instead of, uh, um, instead of uh, an array of arrays, we're just gonna make it a pointer of arrays. 
And in this case, uh, Powerful um, it managed to insert the same directive. It did understand the point of aliasing correctly. And uh, also, uh, Setos uh, um, did manage to understand it. However, Autopal inserted this directive. And do you know why it's incorrect? Because we need a reduction. We need a reduction on C. So Autopal, when we told him, assume that these, this code doesn't have pointer aliasing, it somehow produced an incorrect directive. So with Autopal, we need to be uh, more cautious. So to sum up, um, Autopal failed um, the nested loop test, the function side effect test, and the pointer aliasing, we did find some cases, cases that it did manage to uh, understand it. So it's a plus minus. Powerful um, did manage, uh, it's incorrect there. It did manage, uh, it, it's supposed to be a plus sign there. It did manage to, uh, to identify the nested loop and the function and the uh, pointer. And uh, Setus, um, we can claim that maybe because he put the if 10,000 operations that it that it would be actually okay. Um, and function, well, they did fix it in set of two, so it's also plus minus. And pointer, he did manage to identify correctly. So if we'll uh, look at the speed up from uh, the first example, from the first um, loop that uh, they paralyzed, then um, on three, uh, 32 cores, which means that the uh, theoretical speed up is 32. And uh, the y axis is the number of elements of the matrix, and the y axis is the speed up. We can see that uh, Powerful is the best because it did produce us the best uh, directive. Afterwards, we see Otopa, which uh, had two for loops, and Setus, which put, which put a reduction, which is the lowest from all of them. Now I will, I will ask the question is this actually a too simple problem for source to source compilers? Oh yeah, it's really simple. It's just a matrix multiplication. It's the bread of butter of every uh, source to source compiler. It, if it fails completely in this test, then what is it good for? So we took the same three uh, uh, tools and we looked at another benchmark, which is called NAS, which is numerical uh, uh, aerodynamic simulation, which was created by NASA. And uh, it contains 11 uh, benchmarks, which mimics real life calculations. Um, that uh, scientists every day uh, execute. And it is written in Fortran and C, and only in the latest version they updated with updated it with OpenMP. And um, we didn't take all the 11 ones, we only took uh, these, multigrid conjugate gradient that I also think you saw in the homework, and uh, uh, UA, EP, and LU that I also think you saw in your uh, homework. And uh, if we look at the speed up results, so the X axis is the type of the benchmark. Okay, you don't need to remember BTCG, just that it's a unique benchmark that mimics a real life application. And the Y axis is the speed up. We can see that except for CG, all of the others ended up with really unsatisfying results. Not only that it didn't upgrade, uh, speed up our program, it degraded the performance of, the, of this uh, uh, program. You can see at MG that it's, the bars are really low. At BT, it's actually zero. So what actually happened there? This is over 32 cores. Right? This is over 32 cores, yes. And, 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 and even in CG, we are far from the theoretical speed up. So can you guys think, how did we end up with these results? The results of degrading the performance, not even, gave, not even speed up of one. It's less than one. Exactly, it's because the uh, ineffective of creation of overheads. And if we look at these, uh, um, let, let's talk about their limitations. Um, if we look at uh, specific examples from the test that it failed completely, well, uh, the most common mistake that uh, these compilers made um, was inserting a directive in the innermost loop that had about four iterations. And in this case, we know that we have a lot of overhead in, in the creation of threads. So this is the main reason. And now what happens if we take all of these loops and remove them? Because let's, um, let's uh, claim that it's an honest mistake of the source to uh, source, to source compilers. Let's uh, help them out. 
remove these directives, will we end up with some speed up? After we remove these directives, we actually did end up in gaining a little bit of speed up in BT, LU, MG, SP, and uh, a little bit in UA. So we did actually manage to gain a speed up, meaning that these source to source compilers did manage to insert in some specific uh, for loops a good directive. But what about comparing it to something that a human being would do, something with real intelligence? So we took the NASA um, benchmark that was parallelized with the human being and compared it to the, uh, the source to source compilers. So uh, the x axis is again the benchmarks, the y axis is the, uh, the relative speed up. And we can see that it really performed poorly compared to a human being. We can see that even in CG, where we thought we could, we achieved good results, it's uh, still 20% below what a human achieved. So let's not talk about BT, which is barely 10% uh, 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 compared to what a human can do. And uh, this is actually, uh, you, you can claim that it's decent result because with the zero effort, you got some speed up, but it's still not satisfactory. So if we dive again, <laughs> why did they perform uh, really poorly? Um, you can conclude it in two main things, which is one, the no weight directive. These NAS parallel benchmark had a lot of places where it had no weight, so they didn't uh, create an overhead of threads. And the another thing is the array privatization. Um, these compilers, uh, source to source compilers, uh, can't identify array privatization because it's uh, something that is computationally hard to identify. So um, in many places, you could parallelize the loop if you have uh, a private on an array, and they just couldn't manage that. So if we conclude, we can understand that there is actually no best compiler. We can see that every, every one of them succeeded in some benchmark better than the others, um, which is uh, what we thought it would be because they all have data dependence algorithm. Uh, they implement it differently. They have different heuristics for the OpenMP. They can determine or can determine the function side effects. And the most important thing, they can't replace a programmer. Um, you can gain uh, some speed up um, in, with zero cost, but it won't replace us. And because we see that there is no best directive, this raises a possibility of maybe taking all three, applying it on the code, and then deciding and picking the best one, and then somehow uh, create the best directive. So this is an idea um, that we uh, implemented a, a couple of years ago, which is called COMPA. And the main idea, is, as I said, is taking these three uh, automatic source-to-source -source compilers, applying them um, on the source code that you have, and applying them um, with the different flags, different uh, uh, options, and then picking the best one. But how can we decide which directive is best? If settles and autopal put me an OpenMP directive, how can I uh, um, decide which one is the best automatically? So it's 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 really hard. It's it's practically impossible. So what we can do, we can execute the code and then decide which one is the best. So the idea of Compile is not only um, applying every one of them uh, independently; it's also executing each one uh, independently and then picking the best directive from each one of them. So the, the, um, we give the user the option to execute or not execute the code. Otherwise, we'll just uh, um, choose at random um, whoever put the directive. And of course, with the heuristic that if a compiler um, put his directive on the outermost loop, then we'll pick him because it will be the less uh, amount of overhead. So, um, um, so yeah, it's true. It, some people might choose a heavy test case. And it's something that you, you will need to uh, consider if you want to operate it and get the best directive. And because we execute uh, um, these uh, codes, we actually can do another fine tune to the OpenMP directive. What about scheduling? Okay, so um, after we apply these directives, we can actually insert another type of scheduling, schedule static, dynamic, 
and even operate some runtime uh, uh, libraries, uh, such as setting the open OpenMP threads. And then we can just really uh, fine tune and optimize the directive. So the idea is uh, taking these three compilers, um, creating a combination uh, of applying it to each for loop, and then inserting uh, scheduling. And then create multiple files and execute them and choose the best one. Um, of course, Compa has a lot of uh, different options because uh, it creates a lot of different combinations to find out the, the best uh, um, directive. So it goes through all of the schedule clauses, which is scheduled dynamic. Uh, at the time that we did it, uh, it didn't have automatic. And um, we also go through the OpenMP set non threads and, of course, all of the different options that Compa, Autopad, and Powerful have. So how does it uh, work under the hood? Uh, we first locate all the for loops and then we time it because we need the execution times. And then we produce all the combinations with applying the different uh, source to source uh, compilers with the different scheduling. And then we're gonna execute them, um, e execute the, uh, the code, and then uh, um, extract the best OpenMP directive and uh, push it to the final result. So let's see an example. We have here a piece of code that uh, um, does a simple uh, scalar uh, vector multiplication. We have two for loops, the upper one and the lower one. And uh, after we execute Compa on it, we found out that the upper loop was paralyzed by Autopa because it managed to do the best directive and the lower one with the settings. So how good is Compa? If we look at the results um, of NAS, the same uh, benchmark uh, from the three uh, compilers, we, the x-axis is again the uh, benchmarks, the upper uh, graph uh, is in runtime, the lower graph is in speed up. So I think it's better to look at the runtime. Uh, we can see that the green bar, which is Compa, is always be, uh, the, the most uh, fastest, which is the shortest uh, bar, and uh, which proves that it actually works. It actually does manage to combine them and optimize uh, the loop even further. We also took another benchmark because uh, um, we, we already analyzed a, a lot of, uh, of mass. Uh, what about a different benchmark, which is Polybench? Uh, it has like 30 uh, benchmarks. We only uh, took uh, five, these five. And uh, again, the results of the x-axis is, is the type of benchmark, the y-axis is the runtime or speed up. And uh, once again, if we look at the, uh, the runtime, we can see that the green bar is uh, the lowest because it does manage to um, merge them and produce the best directive. Did you see that there is an obvious trade off in the case of compare between the amount of time that you are going to use this code in the future, the new parallelized code, and the uh, amount of computation that you spend on parallelizing this code, meaning if I have like very small, like a problem, and I'm parallelizing that, it takes me an hour to get the- Okay, I, I understood. Um, so what Gal asked is, um, okay, we have this tool compile and it executes many of the combinations. And um, let's say we took a week to understand which one is the best directive, and we end up with a speed up of two. And then is it worth it? Did, did I just spend a week to understand what's the best directive? And uh, and I barely used the code and I barely gained anything. And um, well, yes, first of all, um, these are benchmark. It's just to see uh, which one uh, is the best. But in practice, the, the main reason why you want to use these automatic parallelization is when you end up in a code that you don't know. You look at a code, you don't know it, and you know that some uh, person asked you, it's running really slow, I waste many time on waiting for this uh, code to finish and uh, please paralyze it. And once you operate the compa, it will probably uh, be uh, worthwhile. I think more than that, it's not only that uh, it takes a lot of time in, in understanding to parallel that, but also that you are going to use this code many times. Exactly. For example, uh, legacy yeah. codes, um, legacy codes um, um, is code that was written a couple of decades ago or years ago, and it's still being used today. And, and uh, it, it's a huge code probably. 
And uh, in these cases, it is worthwhile because this code is uh, is uh, um, is used probably heavily, and it will continue to work tens, uh, you know, decades uh, in in the future. So it, it will be worthwhile. If the compiler couldn't, the compiler can look because there wasn't, a, it couldn't prove that there wasn't a link between the pointer. Will it issue a warning? Listen, uh, I could violate it if you will tell me it's uh, not a list. Okay, it's a good question. It's a good question. And um, Cetus has an interactive uh, tool online, which we'll see in the uh, um, Hirul. And um, it does tell you actually um, the dependencies that it did find out, meaning if you have this output dependency, it will tell you you have an output dependency and I couldn't parallelize it. And uh, if he does manage to parallelize it, he's, he will say, yeah, I, I detected an output dependency here and that's why I put a private. So it does give you, um, Cetus does give you an explanation. The, the two other tools don't give you an explanation because um, most of the people that create these tools think about it as an their intellectual property in, in understanding uh, and finding these dependencies. And another thing is, as I said, there are some cases these algorithms, the data dependencies one, don't converge. And in cases they don't converge, they can't tell you why they didn't converge because they couldn't. So in specific cases, they can tell you, but I think in uh, the simple cases they will, but in uh, tough cases they won't. Um, so we didn't check it, but it um, because it depends. But we didn't check it not not because. Uh, hmm? Ah, um, so Manor asked, um, we, did we compare Compa to a human expert? Um, we didn't do it, but not because we're lazy or anything, but because we know that we have a limit on what Compal can do, and it, its limitation is practically the same limitations that the uh, the three uh, source to source compilers have. So we don't expect him to do some magic optimization and somehow boost up the speed, because the directive that uh, was inserted is just the same directives that the source to source uh, autopal setus and the uh, uh, did. So um, it will be the same results, maybe slightly better, slightly. So it's not to achieve the maximum. Exactly, it's, it's, it, it's to say to people, you don't need to operate the, these three, we'll do it for you. You wanna optimize it, you wanna make it even better, you wanna try and optimize what you do have, we'll try and do it uh, for you. And then you just uh, operate a compile, you forget about it for a week, you return, you have a parallelized code, which is, uh, um, Try to be optimal. Okay, so what are compile limitations, which is uh, um, exactly what I said before. Um, it is a good way to uh, optimize, uh, to parallelize a code that you are unfamiliar with. And uh, even without knowing OpenMP, because um, if you neglect the pointer aliasing, then it will always ensure you that the code is correct. And, um, and it does achieve, uh, um, um, and Compile does uh, try to utilize um, the different uh, compiler uh, um, advantages. So again, what's his limitations and source-to-source -source approach limitations in general? The data dependence algorithms are far from perfect. When you'll start to operate it on hundreds of lines of code, you'll end up with maybe hours of execution time. And, uh, and even after that, he will just give up. And parsing code and generating the AST, which is the phase one, is extremely hard. It's really hard to produce the abstract syntax tree because code um, is constantly changing. They're adding more syntax to the code. And, uh, and what about Python? No one didn't uh, do a source to source compiler for uh, Python, which is PyOMP. And uh, we saw that most of the cases, it actually produces us suboptimal directives. And uh, as I said, it's questionable to use for large codes and legacy codes because you, you might execute it for one week and you will end up with uh, a really low speed up. So after our uh, extended, extended work on source-to-source -source compiler, 
we thought maybe we can attack this problem from a different angle, a different perspective. Maybe we can use some AI tool that will suggest and advise the developer that should be familiar uh, with OpenMP uh, instead of, uh, of inserting it uh, uh, straightforward. Meaning you can imagine uh, this tool that will say, hey, you want to insert here a directive? I found out that in uh, some percentage, you could uh, paralyze this loop. So we're going to talk about actually my uh, uh, PhD work, which is a Pugfoma, a parallel source code completion with NLP. So how is AI related to code? NLP is a natural language processing. If someone um, is familiar with NLP, I'll go through a bit of it anyway. So natural language processing is uh, a, a field in AI that in the couple of last year gained a lot of success and uh, popularity. Um, if everyone, if someone has Alexa in his house, you can see from ChatGPT, which I'm sure everyone is already asking a question to solve his uh, homework. And uh, you have Google Translate, which uses NLP models. You have uh, these autocompletes in your emails. Uh, you can uh, summarize text with it. You can uh, tag uh, uh, specific um, um, prepositions of uh, sentences. And it's really booming in the, in the couple of last year. But what's the connection with code? So um, in the maybe one, two last years, um, a lot of uh, big companies thought, let's use these NLP models, the same NLP models that we saw before, in helping uh, developers in their process of uh, writing code. Okay, so if you look at the left example, this is a work done by Google. They uh, created an NLP model that will try and predict um, the, uh, the functions or variables that the uh, uh, developer wants to write. You can see that it predicts uh, what, it what uh, the developer wants to write and they ended up with uh, increasing the productivity in a couple of few percent, which is a lot in terms of uh, uh, companies such as Google. And uh, another thing that uh, I think you saw in GitHub, which is uh, its co-pilot, which um, given uh, a doc string, uh, something that uh, uh, tells you um, the description of the function, it attempts to um, write the function for you. For example, you can see here that determine the uh, sentiment of the text is positive, and then it's, it, it just fills in automatically the code. So both of these are based on NLP models, on transformers, if someone knows what it is. And uh, the question is, can I use, somehow use these models for detecting places that I can paralyze the code? Not only detect, maybe I want to generate an OpenMP directive with it. And then I'll just, exactly like Google, while, while um, it suggests the developer, hey, did you want um, this specific function? And uh, it can uh, advise, like, do you want this specific directive? So the idea is to pass by the NP hard problems, it, it's, those it's, uh, dependencies and so forth, and and try to understand the rules in a data-driven way. Exactly, it's it, it's actually uh, trying to um, not only um, bypass the um, the NP hard problem of detecting the data dependencies. It's actually it's it's uh, trying to also skip the phase one, which is parsing the text, because I can feed these models with the text of your code. I don't even need to give um, the model the whole code. I can just give it the for loop. So it's a lot more simpler than the whole three phases, and the inference time is in no time. So you, you get you get you get an answer immediately. So you can get nonsense. You also can get it's a trade off. That's why we don't um, insert it, the directive. We uh, tell the, the developer, would you want to insert here? I am sure with this result in X percent. If we'll have time, I'll, I'll show a quick demo. So uh, the idea, as I said, is uh, creating some kind of NLP model that will suggest open AP directives. So we can see uh, some code for loop, um, opening the suggestion from uh, visual code, and then it will uh, try and suggest you want to insert here a problem on people like code and leave the decision for the uh, developer. So uh, in our first work, what we did is firstly identifying locations that can be paralyzed 
which is not producing the whole directive is just saying, I can't, I can't paralyze it. So the first thing that we do, we needed to create some uh, database because this model is data driven. We search uh, GitHub for many codes of OpenMP and uh, we extracted the for loops. Currently our model can only understand for loops because if you give it the whole code, then it won't understand anything. It only understands for loops. And uh, we extracted the for loops and the directive. We have, uh, um, we have uh, positive uh, uh, labels because you need a la the label. It does have a pragma. It doesn't have a pragma. And we ended up with 32,000 uh, unique uh, um, um, uh, entries with uh, 1,500, 15,000 um, OpenMP directives. And the rest of the data doesn't have a directive. So the model performer, as I said, what it should do for this uh, code is detect that the above uh, for loop does have a, uh, an OpenMP directive and even suggest a private clause and the lower one um, without an OpenMP directive. So how do we actually achieve this behavior? We used something uh, common in NLP model, which is called the transformer architecture. Um, I'll go through it uh, really briefly. Um, what it does, it has a lot of encoders uh, um, architectures and it takes every input data and tries to um, understand what words are connected to what words. Meaning after one encoder model, he can say that X1 and X2 are connected um, with one another. And these connections actually in code can mean that they depend on one another. Because if you will uh, say that um, X1 is dependent on X2, then we, we can somehow translate it to some kind of dependency. And this is the main idea. So regarding the results, we took uh, our model and compound and another uh, other simple model, which is called Magic Words. And we um, uh, took the database and we wanted to see how each one of them did with identifying the OpenMP directives and the performer, which is the blue line, is uh, above everyone else, um, which isn't surprising because um, it's a lot better in identifying these locations of OpenMP, which is better than Compile, which really struggles in identifying locations because um, it, it has many pitfalls in understanding the syntax and understanding dependencies, determining function, function side effects. And uh, even if we take two specific uh, uh, benchmark, which is Polybench and Specom, two different, we also see that Pugformer uh, managed to identify locations of OpenMP a lot better. Um, I would want to open the demo. Can I? Does it have internet here? Okay. So um, we uploaded uh, Pugformer in uh, a website called Hugging Face, which uh, is um, a website that you can upload your NLP model. So what we have here is uh, an input, okay? So you have this code, okay? And here you have the original OpenMP directive. So is it a correct uh, directive? No, it's, it's an incorrect, uh, um, it's an incorrect uh, uh, directive, meaning that someone in the database insert uh, a wrong directive. Okay, so it, it does happen um, sometimes in uh, um, in the data driven models, but you assume that this simple case isn't unique, and it uh, probably will appear in this way or some 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 other form, um, but correctly. So let's see what the model does. I will submit this work, and then he'll present. Okay, so he tells me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the code I submit, which means I take this code and I run um, run my model on this code. And then it should tell me if I need an OpenMP directive there. And not only if I need, he will tell me if I need a private or maybe a reduction clause. Okay, so what we see here. Yeah. Ah, th this one? Ah, th this is just detecting what, uh, what language uh, you inserted. So. Have a yeah, so th this is the original directive. This is the original directive. And we know that it's incorrect because we need a reduction on sum. So the results that the um, the model said, he said that we should contain uh, a directive. 
with confidence of 0.67, okay, which was probably because of the uh, 1000, he maybe detects that it's uh, too low of a number. So uh, we'll see after if I uh, put more zeros, then his confidence goes up. And he tells me that I should not have a private clause here, but what, what he does tell me that I should contain a reduction. So he did see this in, in his training phase as uh, something that doesn't need a reduction, but he ended up saying that it does need, because he saw other examples and uh, that, did, that did have uh, this uh, um, reduction clause. So it actually fixed this code. Let's see, so the explanation is not 100% working because explaining an NLP model is hard. And um, there's a fine line between something that is called a tokenization, which uh, um, isn't 100% here. So I wouldn't want to present it, yeah. It's from the user. So what so we did, we a wrong director. Mm -hmm. and then you run the yeah, okay. yeah. We we can actually, um, I can actually uh, change this and insert like two more zeros, and then uh, see what the model does. Maybe he will have more confidence that it should uh, uh, contain an OpenMP directive. So yeah, I inserted two more zeros and from 67%, sure he had uh, a directive, it went up to 82%. Meaning that um, he did understand that um, uh, 1000 is not enough for an OpenMP directive and all of a sudden it is enough. So going through the explainability, if we look at the benchmarks and try and apply uh, um, the explainability tool, which is also in the demo in Hugging Face. And um, we have this example, okay, which um, it predicted that it should have an OpenMP directive, which is correct. So we can see that he focuses what is uh, um, highlighted in orange, which is uh, the array variable, the loop variable J, and even the array variables A. So we do gain a sense here that it does understand um, what to focus on. And uh, the, um, the example below, we have a printf, which we know can be parallelized, and he does identify it correctly. And he says that it, it's mostly because of this exact uh, function. So to conclude, I presented you the foundations of shed more memory parallelization, what actually interferes with other dependencies, and how we actually can transform and eliminate them. And then we talked about the past, present, and uh, future of uh, automatic parallelization, where the past and present is the source-to-source -source, uh, compilers and uh, their uh, pitfalls and their limitations. And uh, the future, which is uh, uh, automatic parallelization advisor with AI, which is performant. Thank you. So we will do now um, a small panel. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, great presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask a few questions, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. I wrote it down uh, <laughs> during the during the um, the talk. Um, first of all, I think that uh, I have like few notions uh, about performer. Uh, why not, for example, that performer learns from uh, source code that was produced by an S2S uh, uh, compiler? Uh -huh. I mean, you're trying to learn from data that you got from the internet, and as you presented, they are you, you get yeah. some wrong labeling. Mm -hmm. So why not using code that you get from... Yeah, so NLP models usually need um, a lot, a lot, a lot of data, which is a lot more than 32,000 uh, what, what we use. And um, the, the main reason why we didn't use um, these source of compilers for uh, the training, because we understood that they have many pitfalls and um, they produce a lot of suboptimal directives. And 
if we have to choose between learning from a human expert and learning from a tool, we're of course going to take the human expert uh, approach. And uh, we didn't want to learn from the mistakes of these sources of compilers. We wanted to be independent from them uh, uh, you know, uh, totally. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the main idea why we took only examples from GitHub and not took many codes from the internet, uh, use compile on them, and then uh, learn from it. Uh, question? Yeah. So first of all, it doesn't sound like enough examples, okay? And it doesn't sound like enough good examples, right? Maybe, I mean, the learning, you know, from big data mm -hmm. is big enough. You assume that most of it is good. I mean, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. one. But I, I think we're going up to NLP, right? Is maybe the wrong direction. You 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 have an expertise in making this happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so my question is why not making it interactive? Okay. I mean, at the end of the day, you're trying to understand the dependencies. Right, for mm -hmm. example, loops. Right, so you're trying to say, so you're trying to say if this loop can be run, you know, independent, you know, in, in parallel, mm -hmm. or, or there are dependencies. So, I would imagine that a tool would, would tell me the potential of parallelizing any, you know, such loop, right, and ask me, can this loop be parallelized, right? So, and there are tools like that. I hope I made myself clear, right? Yeah, I, I think you made yourself clear. So our our idea is is to create some advisory tool. So um, exactly like Google did, it, it didn't try to um, replace the programmer like ChatGPT doesn't try to replace anything. It's just there to help and make our life more easy. So you can imagine um, myself uh, writing the code and then a big for loop. Okay, and now I have to parallelize it. So if I didn't have this kind of NLP tool, I'll just go through the whole code, try and understand the dependencies. And once I do have this, this model, it can help me um, skip some phases. It can, it can already tell me, um, okay, you can't paralyze it because I, I, I uh, identified these, this uh, dependency, or maybe it tells me you can paralyze it because of these private clauses on these specific variables. So, so you're saying like that the, uh... The introduction of data-driven models, they do not replace. They are not in this case. case. There, yeah, it's really hard to replace a, a, a human, and so it's, um, it's pretty easy. It's, <laughs> so yeah. why, why not here? Because it, it's a, a you can't ever ensure one hundred percent accuracy um, to the developer. So you can't force him and put an open API director when you can't ensure it with a, a deterministic algorithm like the sources of compiler. So you have to always um, say, okay, I'm confident at, at 80 percent that you should parallelize this, but I'm leaving you the final decision because I can't ensure the, the correctness because if it will answer, answer me the directive, then I might ruin this code and he might not know it. He might trust me completely. Mm -hmm. and, and it's wrong as as uh, was proven many times that you can't trust ChatGPT completely because mm -hmm. you always need to uh, um, uh, take it with a uh, um, grain of salt. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the point. That when you look at a, at a loop or you know, snippet of code, the, the compiler can never know if there are dependencies external. Only the programmer, sometimes, sorry, me, only, only me can know. And this is why I think the right approach is to tell you what is the potential of parallelizing. Which is basically what it does. It does give you, it doesn't tell you, it doesn't only say if it's safe to paralyze it. Okay, so I think the question refers to the amount, and correct me if, 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 if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. the amount of speed up that you will gain from the insertion of that as well. When you what will you get? If you put it here, what will you get? Stuff, stuff like that. Now, you know, Intel Advisor, for example. Mm -hmm. It does something. It's doing that, yeah. But like that's in runtime. What? But that's in runtime. No, it just, yeah, it, it has to that, analyze that, That's a complete different. That, that's satisfying. It has to analyze your process, right? Now, everything we're doing here is for huge, right, um, 
program. Otherwise, it doesn't don't care. Another question on the resource, uh, resource compiler. Mm -hmm. so we saw that in many cases there is a regression on log gains because of mm -hmm. so uh, in my opinion, why don't they do some sort of interactive models? Uh, so they run it serial, they see the hotspots and they they focus on these uh pores or loops that have the highest because control. they need to execute the code. The the starting point of these source of source compilers is we don't want the programmer to run the code um, because if he does run the code, then it, it, it's a lot more complex to compile already run the code. Well, in compile, we did fix it, but we need internally in their algorithm to pinpoint the places. And we did do also in compile um, once we saw uh, for loops that didn't have. Uh, uh, a speed up, we remove them completely. Meaning that if it did insert a directive that created a lot of overhead, we did remove it. So, uh, compare all it run it at serial as well? Yes, yes, it runs at serial. And if you, and if you, if it detected that a, a directive creates overhead, it removes it. Okay. So, it does ensure us that, but it doesn't uh, pinpoint this is the most ex uh, uh, intensive place. Let's focus on this because. The the source to source compiler will try to parallelize it one way or another, so it, it doesn't really matter. Okay, and then for the other tool, the NLP model needs a lot of example to be more efficient. Why limiting to GitHub and not GitHub and other open source? Because um, um, it's a lot more harder to extract these data from automatically from uh, GitLab, but uh, it, it's something that we do plan to do. And um, we also need to ensure that um, these uh, uh, um, examples aren't uh, the same example because we don't want duplicates. We don't want it to be overfitted for some problem. Yeah. Looking forward to the, how we can improve this tool. Or... Yeah, so we have many things uh, to improve. One of them is uh, the representation of the code. So we currently put it as a text. But what if we put it put uh, an abstract syntax tree maybe of the text of the text maybe it will be better maybe if we took another representation of the text maybe if we somehow uh, do some pre-processing to the text maybe it will also and uh, of course we know that um, we need to find more examples to put in the database to enhance the performance. You consider looking at the IR stage? And yes, we we it's. It's um, our next step in our work to use intermediate representation. Yeah, this, I know. This master student over there, that is that is master. Yeah. Doing that with, uh, uh, with IR. Mm -hmm. okay. um, can you explain again, please, uh, what's the advantage of source to source compilers over traditional ones? Um, source to source, um, the main advantage of source to source is that you are, uh, you can see the directive that it put there. You know what the compiler did, the source to source compiler did. So you can analyze it, you can understand if you maybe want to fine tune it, you can understand exactly like me. I removed the directive in, in uh, the NAS parallel benchmark. I removed it because I know that it doesn't need to be there. But what about a, a, a regular compiler? It doesn't tell me when it managed to insert the parallel directive and when it didn't. So it may be ineffective. And not only that, it's, um, um, yeah. I think that you, you can also get a degradation of performance, right? When you do that binary, like- Yeah, you, and you the also can- uh, Automatic parallelization in, in a compiler. And, 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 um, and you don't really know what, what happened at all. It's like, it's like a back box. It's yeah, like it's, a, it's a black box. And working on the assembly. And another thing that connects to something that uh, was asked during the presentation uh, is, is the source to source compilers sometimes do tell you why they didn't manage, manage to insert a directive. So when they, uh, when they tell you, I didn't manage because there's a true dependency, it gives you as a developer uh, some way to change the code that it will manage to insert the directive. The compiler won't tell you, okay, I didn't manage to put here a directive, so, um, please change something so I could. It won't tell you that. So the source-to-source -source, uh, uh, tool allows you this back-to-back uh, um, -back process, like, 
Okay, it didn't manage. Let's change the code. Oh, it did manage. Good. Let's go to the next one. So the question was one big factor we didn't talk about. Mm -hmm. It's all hardware dependent. How many cores you have? What kind of cores? This is what Compar does. Memory. This, this is what Compar does. It, it uh, runs through the amount of uh, of threads that you can uh, that can you you can select. Because sometimes you will want maybe to all just create four threads, maybe you will want 16, maybe you have a machine that has 112. So this is exactly what we do. We, we try to find the sweet spot between uh, the, the speed up and the number of threads. So this is the uh, uh, source to source compilers of the Power Power Forward Setos don't consider hardware. We saw that Setos asked if there's more than 10,000 operations. It's, in the, it's independent in the hardware. It just, decided to put a rule of thumb. But Compound it does exactly that. It does try to understand, um, you execute your code on a specific machine. It found out that this exact directive is, uh, is, unnecess is unnecessary, then it will remove it, considering this type of uh, hardware. I think that also OpenMP ICV uh, got much, much better over the years. And now that when you write uh, your Pragma, so you get much more familiarity with the with the hardware underneath. So if you get the right pragma, I think that you will get get it uh, uh, properly attached to the to the hardware underneath because because often if you read the specs before, in in many ways. Uh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, why do we only talk about OpenMP? It seems like there is a cartel of OpenMP. <laughs> what about all the other, what about CUDA? What about MPI? What about OpenCL? What about SQL? Why, why there is no automatic parallelization in those cases? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it, it, it's a really good question. Um, regarding CUDA and uh, SQL and uh, these types of uh, parallelization uh, APIs are, aren't really, um, Thread based, they are tax based. Um, so when you try and answer those, you usually need uh, a heavy understanding of the dependent of the dependencies of the of uh, the code, and uh, the inherent changes of the code is not as simple as putting a simple directive. It involves in changing the whole code, so it's a lot harder for a source to source compiler um, to uh, to be able to manage to do it and. Of course, for an LP model, it's even more harder. And uh, regarding OpenCL, it, um, an example for OpenACC, which are directed based um, for uh, um, for uh, um, heterogeneous uh, system, um, we searched GitHub for these uh, um, these types of uh, directives, and we didn't find a lot of examples of them. So they aren't really as common as OpenMP, and um, and I think not. I think in the next version, or even now, the versions of uh, of Intel compiler, when they parallelize um, loops in internally, they insert OpenMP directly, mm -hmm. straightforward. So um, it, it does seem like um, it's going to uh, be the main core that everyone uh, exactly because OpenMP um, since a couple of years ago, they also started um, supporting uh, for heterogeneous systems. And uh, now that Intel has their own kind of GPUs, then we're going to see more OpenMP for GPUs. And then they have SQL, which uh, also tries to replace CUDA. So we see that there is some kind of tendency toward OpenMP. So this was the main focus of, of most of the source to source compilers and uh, our uh, uh, work. Another question. Uh, yeah, this is Ben. Thank you very much, Ram. Thank you.